Hi, I'm Tim, this is Watchbox Studios, and welcome back to Watch Is Live. For those of you keeping score out in the World Wide Web, this is Watch Is Live Episode 6. For those new to the format, I'm going to take you through a selection from our collection at Watchbox. I've got everything from Heimek Cartier, yes, they do exist, to our bread and butter. We've got Steel Omega, Speedmasters, and Seamasters both, and one you might not expect. Of course, our company started with Panerai, and thus the Italian Officine is well represented. I want to give a greeting to our first in the box tonight, Matt Foster welcoming Edward Layden from Sweden. Hey, Edward, staying up. I appreciate that. Vincent Tan joining in. All right, guys, of course, this is an interactive show. I'm going to be showcasing, but at the same time, I am answering your questions live. And I'm happy to say I'm giving away cool swag roughly every 10 minutes or so. Recognize that Rolex green? That's right. You could be rolling with that rollerball in your office tonight. Watches live at thewatchbox.com is our email. Send in your name, your address, and your phone number so I can send you what you win after I pick the winner. Oh, okay. We're going old school. Never mind, guys. We're using Tim at thewatchbox.com. Okay, even easier to remember. So let's get started tonight. Our company began with Panerai way back in the wild, wild web days of 2001. And back in those days, this style of watch was actually surprisingly accessible. That's right, that's the original 42mm Mare Nostrum. The watch born as the 5218-203, the chronograph that no one wanted then is now a highly collectible piece, so much so that it actually earned its own tribute reference from Panerai. This is a 2017 special series. You can see the T serial number is now in play of 1,000 pieces. The 716 recaps everything you knew and loved from that first gen watch you wish you bought back in the day. 42 millimeter steel case, that beautifully calibrated kilometer scale tachymeter, of course, the twin register, and the gorgeous patina style indices and hands with blued hands at center and a twin register chrono. Now I have to say this watch is fantastic because in so many ways all of that pre-Vendome Panerai is a little bit too delicate, too collectible, and too valuable to wear on the wrist today. Some of them haven't aged well. Some have been adulterated in progress. So the one you want to wear is this T-Series reissue. Again, it's got the look, it's got the feel, it's got the livery, but brand new and with a warranty. All right, guys, joining us in, I see Tom Hung is joining. I see Robin Rickett is joining us from London. All right, guys, staying up late and getting up early. Far-flung time zones all. Thank you so much. I appreciate this. And yes, I do pick winners from our international audience. So Tim at thewatchbox.com, send me your name, your phone number, your email, of course, will come to me, but I need your address to send you the goods. I've got Rolex stuff tonight, and it doesn't end with the pens. Don't worry, that's a Victorinox. That's real sturdy. All right. So in 2013, Panerai went where it had not gone before. Not into the depths of the ocean, but into the world of the technician's watch. Now, the Arctos models, the Mike Horn models, had probed the anti-magnetic phenomenon in the past, but it was this model, the PAM389 Luminor Submersible 1950 amagnetic that really took the concept to the extreme. The first application of a ceramic capped bezel on a Panerai, this is a titan of titanium, so though it is immense, it's a 47 millimeter 1950 profile case. Nevertheless, this watch does wear easy on the wrist, so much so that on my pencil thin 16 centimeter wrist, I wear this one with comfort. It's one of my favorite Panerai models of all stripes, and I have to say, in the real world where most of us have limited time, and sometimes failing eyes. It's the reality of the diving bezel that works as the best countdown timer. Not the chronograph, but the dive bezel. I just had a conversation with a friend whose son's gonna be off to college soon, and I'm happy to say that my graduation watch an Omega Seamaster 300 served me well counting down till time during my tests in college, and it was that dive bezel that made it possible. In-house automatic three-day caliber, this is a true ISO 6425 spec diver, wears like a mammoth on the wrist, a mountain of metal, and feather light thanks to the tie. It also wears beautifully thanks to the shield of the ceramic capped bezel. That is one of my favorites, guys. Okay. 
Our friends joining us tonight, I see Andrew Holt is in here. He's saying, uh, back in the day, we used to make some Panerai videos in Florida. And that's a fact for those just joining us. Our company started in 2001 on eBay with Panerai. Back then, we were the hookup for a brand that was then poorly distributed in the U.S. and poorly communicated by corporate. We were effectively the Paneristi outpost in the Western Hemisphere. And because Panerai has come a long way since then, as we have at the Watchbox, it's no longer just about the hardcore tool watch. Right here, I have a watch that launched in 2014 as part of a series of three precious metal Panerai chronographs. What makes this PAM520 special isn't that it features the classic pioneering 2533 prototype dial from the 30s. It's not that this was the only of the 518, 519, 520 series with a sandwich composite construction dial. It's the fact that this watch combines a black dial, white gold, and I hope you're ready for this one, guys, because honestly, if my if my fingernails don't fail me, you're going to get a look at possibly the most beautiful chronograph caliber ever in a Panerai. You know what? Let's improvise this. Macro camera, make it happen. This is a Minerva 1322 manual wind vintage chronograph caliber. You may have seen it online in the Mont Blanc 1858 Villaray series. Here it is, as finished by Mont Blanc Villaray, also known as Minerva. This is a level of finish hitherto unknown in Panerai. Beveled edges that are mirrored, straight grained levers of a column wheel chronograph, and an immense traditional balance wheel. You can see that balance almost one-third the diameter of the entire movement. That's the way they did it old school. A big slow boot pocket watch style movement. You can, cap, you can actually count each individual tick. That's how slow that enormous balance is. Manual wind and you'll love winding this one every other day. This is a true work of art inside a work of art. If you're into recursive art or you think Panerai can be more than the sports watch on your wrist, maybe the dress watch at the ball. This watch is the bell of the ball and one of the most extraordinary Panerai references I've ever seen. In fact, I would even say that this is my all-time favorite Panerai chronograph, period. More than the 163 with its exquisite vintage value movement, more than the 192 with its pink purple tantalum case, it's this one, the 520 that I would want for myself. And this is a watch that originally retailed for over $60,000 when new. Own it through the magic of watch box for under 40. Column wheel operation, crisp as a rifle bolt. This is one to savor. Oh, right. I see AMG is joining us from Tampa, St. Louis today. Well, Tampa, that's sort of our old haunt across Alligator Alley back in Florida. Welcome, AMG, and I have to say you have outstanding taste in cars. My heart also beats to the beat of a Falterbach. Now, moving on through Panerai, we go from the world of high horology to High-tech materials. Now, this is a watch, the PAM 616. It's a luminar submersible with the 1950 case, yes. But this is the answer to the question, how does Panerai evolve as a brand? Many folks said that watches like that 520, though exquisite, quite simply don't keep the faith with the core of the Panerai tool watch ethos. They're too complicated. They're too busy. They're too fine. So how do you, how do you move the ball at a company whose Paneristi fans really don't want the watch to evolve? Well, you take the classic look, the legibility, the iconic device protecting the crown luminor profile, and like Colin Chapman might have said of Lotus, you add lightness. The Carbotech material, when seen in profile, let's see if we can get a little bit closer, guys, but the Carbotech material is almost like, the, there you can see it well, it's almost like the layers of a tree. The meristematic zone grows out, leaving layers that allow you to count the years since the birth of the tree. And here you can see the layers of the layup of the carbon fabric, frozen in resin and then machined to the shape of the Luminor 1950 case. Now, what makes this watch extraordinary is that the Carbotech is super light. Let me, let me shine up that crystal because, frankly, it deserves better than my fingerprints. This is a watch that has the legibility of a Panerai. It has the pomp and circumstance of a special edition, even though it is not a limited series. It has that vintage patina, but the blue accents really make it pop. This is a watch of charismatic color, and thanks to the three-day caliber, it also has Panerai's latest innovations in watchmaking. Now, the three-day caliber automatic, based on the caliber 9000 family, means that this one is quite solid. Free-sprung, it has that Rolex free-sprung balance architecture that resists bumps and disruptions on the wrist. It even features a Carbotech device protecting the crown layer. 
or lever, lever, I should say, in layers. Now, if you're familiar with the way the Panerai works, I don't need to explain this to you. But for those who may be new to the mechanism, essentially, it's a way of locking the crown via a cam system that makes it easier to open and operate while your hands are gloved, sweaty, or wet. Now I can wind the watch, I can set the watch, all of that's accessible. I close the crown, and now the watch has 300 meters water resistance. Panerai, of course, born of military necessity in the 1930s, supplying the Desma Flotilla, pioneering Italian Navy spec war frogmen. They were often propelled into battle by what's known as the SLC, the Solora Lanta Corsa, also known as the Pig, a manned torpedo that could be used to bomb Royal Navy battleships, as in the raid on Alexandria. The image of the SLC or the Pig immortalized on the reverse side of the PAM-616 Carbotech. Again, one of the best special edition Panerai of the modern era. And it's probably worth, since I have sung the praises of that in-house caliber, to show you a little bit of how it works, because it does have a few tricks up its sleeve, even if this watch at 47 millimeters could never fit under your sleeve. Okay, now you can see it features hacking. But what it also features is a special time zone adjustment mechanism that can run the date backwards or forwards. The convenience of that for world wanderers being as you're jumping across the international date line without actually stopping the movement, you can engage this time zone function forward or backwards. Again, ideal for world wanderers, and once you get to your vacation spot, no better way to style on the beach. And like the PAM 389, this one features that robust unidirectional rotating dive style bezel. Okay. Now, we have a question from Andrew Holt. What does PAM stand for? And I have to say, this is something that I don't believe has a definitive answer, but it's been mooted that it was planned with English in mind, and the abbreviation means nothing more than Panerai model. So that, that is the best guess what Panerai PAM stands for. All right, so question from Andrew Holt, is this the carbon rhodiomere? No, it's the carbon luminor. The carbon rhodiomere, I believe, is the 661. This is the 616. Okay. So now a question from Andrew Holt. Is a Valjoux movement an ETA? The answer is sort of, but not really. If you think the Jeep Cherokee was a Chrysler, then you kind of get the idea. The Cherokee was designed by American Motors with help from its then owner, Renault. Once purchased by Chrysler in the late 1980s, the Jeep Cherokee became a Chrysler by default. And so it is with the Valjoux family of movements. Uh, Valjoux was an independent watch brand until the 70s when it was eventually aggregated into the family of ASWAG and SSIH watch companies that became um, the Swatch Group ultimately. But Valjoux was its own brand, designing movements with its own budget, its own engineers, and its own facilities. When you hear about old movements like uh, the Valjoux 222 or the Valjoux 7750, they were designed while Valjoux was still independent in the 60s and early 70s. Therefore, we still distinguish Valjoux 7750, even though it is built at the ETA building, or I should say ETA super complex in Greenwich, Switzerland today. So by inheritance, yes, a Valjoux is an ETA, but it does have an independent route with a separate company. Okay. Yes, I must say, Tom Hung, this is the Carbotech submersible. You know your Panerai. Now, Panerai, of course, continues to evolve. If the Carbotech is too out there for you, but you want something special, may I propose the Radiomir 8 Days PAM 735. Now, this marked the arrival of green dials within the mainstream Panerai production. You remember the 507 and the 382 Bronzos had green dials, but this gives you that handsome military-inspired olive drab with rich rose gold hands at center, patina-style loom, and a beautiful brushed wire lug rhodiomere case. This is a 45 millimeter watch that wears easy on a smaller wrist, light, wieldy, and with a very minimal lug-to-lug -lug span. This is my choice if you want a Panerai to share with your significant other. Yes, it's thick because the in-house caliber with a gorgeous case back reserved to marsh indicator is thick but the watch wears light, and thanks to its screw-down crown, it also wears well in the water. A perfect vacation watch this holiday season. Beautiful on the back, 
and true to its Panerai heritage with a simple dial unadorned by complication, this could be your one and only watch. Make no mistake, it's elegant enough with that gorgeous, I believe this is called the Ponto Vecchio strap in calfskin and the patina treatment of the olive drab. This could be your dress watch, absolutely it could. It could also be your sports watch. Again, the nice thing about the wire lug rads, as long as we're not talking about the original PAM 21 Special Series, you can remove those lugs with a screwdriver in the comfort of your own home and swap the strap. For good measure, note the free sprung balance with a full balance bridge anchored on both sides. That gives you the durability you expect in something like a Rolex, but with the beauty you expect in a Panerai in-house caliber. And you can see how the bridges are beautiful, straight grained. There's a nice beveling along the flanks, and there's a medley of colors from the lacquer set within the engraving to the violet of the pivot jewels, the blue of the screws, and the gold elements that pop against that silver rhodium-plated brass movement architecture. Absolutely beautiful. And this might be my favorite Panerai of the year, PAM 735 Rodimir 8 Days. Okay. So I can see right here, Josh Thanos, nope, Polanski, my mistake. Josh might be out there, but it's Josh Polanski now, who asks, Tim, why did JLC discontinue the tribute to 1931? Okay, that was the, that was the 2011 Reverso Ultra thin. The tribute to 1931 spawned a series of others like it, featuring the green dial of the London Boutique, the red dial of the JLC Boutique Reverso Rouge, but it's been discontinued, I think, to build up excitement for a reissue in the future. It is essentially the 15202 Royal Oak of Chagère Le Coult. It's the closest thing to their core original 1931 Reverso. I think that's a bullet they want to keep in the chamber for a special occasion. It returned on the 80th anniversary, disappeared shortly thereafter. I would say, if anything, the return of the king is inevitable, but I don't know when. Now, I'm going to pick a winner from my Tim at Watch You Want email address. All right, so let's see. Remember, guys, you can't just send me your name. You got to send me an actual mailing address so I can send it out to you. Snail mail is still necessary for me to send you a Swiss Army knife. Okay, so let's see what we got right here. Okay, Matt McLaughlin. Congratulations, Matt. You have just won a Victorinox Billet Aluminum Rolex Commemorative Swiss Army Knife. This one's got it all, or at least all of the essentials. You've got a screwdriver, a nail file, You've got a small blade and a set of scissors, suitable for a keychain, unsuitable for the TSA. Remember, before you fly, take it off your keychain. Other than that, you are good to go. This is as beautifully made as a Rolex watch itself. It's solid, it's chunky, it's hefty in the hand. It's an impressive piece and incredibly exclusive. The only way you can get one of these is a swag through a Rolex distributor. And I'm fortunate here at the watch box, we happen to know one on the Govberg side of the family. It even comes with this gorgeous Rolex green sheath. So not only do you get a knife, you get a knife with accessories. Congrats, Matt. We've got another one to give away as well as two Rolex pens. So if you didn't win, you're still in the running for Rolex. Whether you bleed green or you just need some green this holiday season to buy gifts for other people, I've got your back with swag tonight. All right, so going back to our collection, let's step away from Panerai because I get the sense that mil-spec Italian-inspired timepieces are not for all. How about a watch with a French military inflection? This is the Breguet Type 20 Aero Naval, a watch launched during the early stages of the Breguet comeback when it was still a member of the Invest Corp family of companies back in the early 90s. This is a perfect combination of a rich adobe red dial with rose gold to match 39.5 millimeters. This is an exquisite aviator style timepiece that pays homage to the original 1954 Breguet Type 20. Of course, others such as Dodin also produced the Type 20, but it was Breguet which persisted with the type into the 1970s, right up to the cusp of its Chaumet ownership, Breguet being the most closely identified with the Type 20 series. And this being a very wearable example, you can see the condition is outstanding, with the definition of the coined case flanks, as well as the knurling of the bezel, and on the case back, deep and rich marks evincing gentle wear and little, if any, refinishing ever. You'll also note Etanche 100 meters. This is an aviator's timepiece, but equally suitable for those who prefer water wings. Seaplane pilots, 
your watch has come in. Now the watch does feature a Breguet 582 caliber based on the Lemania 1300 series, automatic wind with a quick set for the date and a 48 hour power reserve. It's a tank tough movement for a sports watch that nevertheless boasts a Breguet high horology pedigree. And I will also say there are those for whom only one Breguet model exists in the current era. Now, in the classical era of Breguet himself, pocket watches were your only option. Pocket watches and clocks built by the master and his apprentices. Now, during the 20th century, watches like the Marine were added under Daniel Roth, caretaker of the Breguet brand under the Chaumet brothers during the 1980s, and of course the Type 20 of the 1950s for the French armed forces. But realistically, the watch for which Breguet is arguably famous as a wristwatch manufacturer, didn't show up until Basel World 2005. And that was when Breguet, now under Swatch Group ownership, gave the world the 50, or I should say the 7027. 50 hour power reserve in the 7027. This is the 7027 BR, rose gold with blackened bridges. It's a masterclass in watchmaking, in as much as everything starts at the crown which winds the central barrel, takes pride of place over the dial. You can tell this is a watchmaker's movement. And then from the second wheel to the third wheel, the fourth wheel, and ultimately the toothed escape wheel transfers the power to an aerodynamically styled free sprung balance. Why do I say it's an aerodynamically styled balance? Because you can see the variable inertia balance blocks which move the polar moment smaller or larger, in or out, are actually recessed into the balance. You can see how they're recessed in from the rim. That minimizes the effect of aerodynamic drag on the incremental power loss of the balance. Yes, even that was taken into account. But perhaps even more extraordinary is a rare modern implementation of the Breguet parachute shock absorption system. It doesn't use a spring so much as it uses a long, finely finished metallic arm over the capstone. This is a pocket watch shock protection system invented by the master himself, re-implemented by the artisans of the modern Breguet in a wristwatch format. And you can see it does feature stop seconds, as well as a very discreet reserve demarche indicator at 11 o'clock on what would conventionally be the dial. Now the blackened and rose lathe cut guilloche dial is actually 18 karat solid gold. So you have the tradition of Breguet masterful materials and masterful treatment of materials amidst a beautifully finished anachronism that is the caliber 507DR. My favorite part of this watch, I have to admit, is the mechanism for the power reserve indicator on the case back. 34 jewels, entirely hand finished. If you get close to it, you will see the hand laid mirror polished rounded anglage on the bridges that you'd expect on any modern watch. You have to look more closely for it, but it is there, an exquisite piece. And I'm happy to say, we have its mechanically identical 38 millimeter yellow gold counterpart, the 7027 BA. For those of you who like the original yellow gold, the master would have recognized this one more closely, I think, than the other. Equally sensational, same caliber 507 DR. Whichever one you put on your wrist, you're gonna be wearing a modern marble and a modern icon, a true living legend of the modern Breguet manufacturer in the tradition of the master himself. And I have to say my favorite modern Breguet. All right. So I have a comment from Robin Rickett, and it looks like he's saying that the 7027 is a triumph of horology over legibility or readability. I would say don't sell it short. It's a very legible watch in person. It's a watch that has to be seen in person to fully appreciate, and that's why we at the Watch Box give you a seven day no questions asked return policy so you can try the watch and tell for yourself. You can even wear it for a week. No questions asked. That means buyer's remorse is an acceptable reason. You say, I don't like it, we accept it. And that's the flexibility of our try before you really buy program. All right, questions coming through. Here's a comment from Joshua Polanski with the innovations from Breguet. I wonder if they lose value on the pre-owned market. Not on that account. I would say Breguet is still building its stature up to the level of something like an FP Journe or a Patek Philippe. They're not quite there yet in terms of perception, but if you're looking at something like the Type 22 or the Classique Chronometry with the ultra high rate escapement and the magnetic pivots for the balance, those are watches that Swatch Group will back until the cows come home and, well, I guess if Switzerland freezes over, until Switzerland fries and hell freezes over. 
these watches are absolutely backed by the number one name in luxury horology. Remember, 70% of Swatch's revenues come from luxury watches, and they make sure they take care of their customers. Okay, I know JBO Surf joining us from Adelaide, Australia, saying, damn, I'm late. No, you're not. You're just in time to see more of what we've got on the table tonight from a house favorite, and I have to admit, where I started with luxury watches, Omega. We just had a talk with a friend of the house about graduation watches for a special son going off to MIT, and I can't think of a better example than a watch that pays tribute to the first Omega in space. Of course, that was Wally Shearer's personal Omega Speedmaster CK2998 pre-moon watch. Now, this is a special series that came out at Basel World 2016, appropriately enough, in 2,998 pieces. It still features the signature moon watch caliber 1861 inside, but this limited edition features a ceramic tachymetric scale, beautiful blue dial appointments, and you'll note, like that original CK2998, this one doesn't feature the asymmetric case with its crown guards of the professional series. Likewise, it features alpha style hands at center and on the counters, just like that pioneering 2998 pre-moon. The watch is a pleasure to wear, and with a case of 39.7 millimeters in stainless steel, it's a little bit more compact on the wrist than a standard 42 millimeter moon watch. So if you do have a more petite forearm or you're looking to split time with a significant other, justify the expense of buying your next watch by promising you'll share it with her or him. We're equal opportunity offenders here at the Watch Box. A spectacular special series and an absolute pleasure to enjoy. I'm glad it's not a replica watch. I'm glad they went silver and blue instead of a straight up reissue like the first Omega in Space numbered edition was. Okay, but not every Omega is vintage inspired which is why we have watches that uphold the traditions of the company without being literal recreations. And that's exactly what 2015's Omega Constellation Globemaster was. Helping to launch the Metaz certified Master Chronometer series, the Globemaster was effectively the series production revival of the legendary Pi Pan Constellation, a model that had been revered by collectors, but rarely revisited by Omega since the Griffin Claw Omega Constellation is one of the top sellers in East Asia, which is an immense market for Omega. So for the purists, Omega waited for the Globemaster to reissue the Pi Pan, and what a watch. At around 40 millimeters, you're not going to find a better universal fit. You'll also note the watch's exquisite details, like the facets of the Pi Pan, the applied rose gold indices and matching hands, the Omega marquee hand applied at 12 o'clock, and on the reverse side, the famed observatory icon that marked the case back of the original chronometer certified constellations from 1952. Of course, this is no longer caliber 8500. It's the 60-hour Metaz certified master chronometer. What does that mean? Well, it means that the watch is tested as a watch, not a bare movement, as with COSC. The watch still meets COSC, no doubt, but it's now assembled and tested to a higher standard to include power reserve, shock resistance, anti-magnetism, as well as a tested, cased-up watch rather than a tested, bare movement. Rich with rose gold, this is one of the finest implementations of two-tone I've ever seen, and to prove that it is a luxury watch through and through, a full deployant clasp, not a nostalgic pin buckle, Omega spared no expense. Now granted, some of us have budgets that don't afford us two-tone, and some of us are just steel is real purists. For us, there's the same watch, there is the constellation in stainless steel with a tungsten bezel. Now tungsten, the material you may have heard about in the news as a proposed weapon in the Rods from God satellite kinetic energy drop system, is used here on the fluted bezel of a stainless steel watch to resist scratches and scuffs without the fracture or shatter hazard of ceramic. Now the watch you see here is exactly the same dial geometry as the watch you just saw, which is to say it has a faceted pie pan layout with gorgeous blue accents that really pop. The dial is a silver metallic, and you can see the case features nuanced finish with hairline polished bevels, as well as a hairline polished to the edge of that tungsten bezel. Satin finished on its flank, it's not too glam rock for me. This is how I would do a dress watch on a full bracelet. 
Now, of course, you can see the bracelet is both tapered and finally finished with those hairline polished bevels along the flanks of the satin links. It's also very substantial, as you can see, fixed with screws, not pins and sleeves. And the clasp itself, double deployant with twin trigger action, absolutely secure on the wrist. For those wondering, you get the same finery on the case back with the Omega Caliber 8900. Let me see if I can get my fingers out of the way here. The Omega 8900 free sprung SI14 A magnetic 60 hour master coaxial chronometer. One feature I probably should have shown you on the other watch is that the bridge architecture is exactly the same. And I mention that because some of these do have rose gold bridges. I want to avert confusion in advance. So we take a detour from Omega to a company that I love deeply. Now, those of you who may have been watching me a few episodes back on my Watchbox Studios channel know that I chucked my Jecher LeCoult Master Compressor Extreme World Alarm off the table several times to demonstrate how on carpet the Master Compressor Extreme case could absorb shock, but I mentioned there was a way to get the same shock resistant effect in a watch that cost less than Richard Mille's millions and less than that JLC's $20,000 retail. And I'm happy to say I have here the Bremont Boeing. Now this is the Bremont Boeing Model 1 Model 1 in black, 43 millimeters, it uses their triptych case construction to physically separate the body of the case from the form of the lugs. Outstanding ergonomics result, but there's more. A sapphire cap, and let me offer this Bremont, the avail of my old school watch you want polishing cloth, but there is a beautifully loomed, sapphire-capped aviator bi-directional bezel on this watch that allows you to easily align with the minute hand for an impromptu countdown timer. What I love about this watch is that the dial is matte, the contrast is high, glare is absolutely minimal thanks to the matte of the dial and the satin finish majority of the case. Now the watch features the shock resistance system to which I alluded. Tested beyond endurance is Bremont's motto for this system in the Boeing series. It gives you the kind of shock resistant you would expect of a Richard Mill on the wrist of Rafa Nadal, only this one will cost you less than $4,000. Also highly water resistant, the watch is 100 meters certified, so throw this one on a water resistant band for fun in the sun this holiday season and you're good to go. Also note, Bremont does nothing with half measures. Screws fix this Seattle style embossed leather strap to the case, not spring bars. Bremont does it right. Salida 220 base, very tough, automatic chronometer certified to boot. All right, so our questions tonight, I want to, before I jump to the question box, give someone something for free. I'm gonna go to my email address and I see right here, Tom Hung, longtime follower of the show. Tom? You are tonight's first winner of a Rolex pen. Now, when I was in the Navy, the CO would, white, would write in red and the XO would write in green. This one's heading to you, XO. Congratulations. Beautifully wrought in Rolex green. Whether you're a Rolex fan or simply a Rolex respecter, as I consider myself, this is going to get your stocking stuffing season off right. All right, moving on. I want to go back to the chat box and try to interact a little bit. I notice we've had quite a few questions coming through. This is from The V asking, why do all dive watches have bi Why not make all dive watches with bi-directional bezels? Couple of things. The first unidirectional dive bezel was on the 1953 Blancpain 50 Fathoms. It wasn't until the transitional submariners of the early 1980s that Rolex got on, and, and the, the second generation sea dweller that Rolex got with the program with the unidirectional rotating bezel. The reason you don't see bi-directional rotating bezels on dive watches today is because since 1996, there has been an international standards organization, ISO rule called 6425, that defines what a dive watch is. And one of the definition elements is there must be some sort of mechanism that cannot accidentally extend the dive that can be used for timing the dive. That's why with a unidirectional bezel, you can accidentally shorten your dive, you cannot accidentally extend past your air time. And that's why you don't see more dive watches with bi-directional bezels. 
Okay, Richard Scott is asking, is Bremont a British brand? You better believe they are. They assemble all of their watches in the greater London area, and they now actually have their own facility for producing their case components. And considering they use heat-tempered metal that is extraordinarily difficult to create and work, that's no small matter. They've also partnered with La Joux Perret of Switzerland to launch their own exclusive line of Bremont calibers. So they're off in a direction that I would say within a generation might restore the former world-class and world-leading reputa reputation of British horology. I actually spoke with the English brothers who are the founders of the brand and they told me one of the goals they have before they're all done and dusted with watchmaking is to try to do for British watchmaking, for instance, what Patek Philippe's Complications Department has done for Swiss horology, where you see people like the late Roger Dubuis, where you see people like Laurent Ferrier coming out of that department and founding exalted brands in their own right, effectively a breeding ground for tomorrow's master watchmaker. So moving through Omega, we're not quite done yet. Here is, I think, my favorite of the Museum Watch series. This is Omega Museum Watch number three from a series that concluded at 10. This is the Officer's 1945, a manual wind, 38.7 millimeter steel column wheel chronograph. This one featuring glorious ovoid pushers in the style of a 1945 triple scale watch from Omega's museum, the caliber 3600 is a tactile pleasure to operate. It has its roots in the Frédéric Piguet 1185 shared with Blancpain and Breguet. Now you can see a telemeter, a tachymeter, and a pulsation scale on the dial with rose gold leaf style hands. The watch, thanks to its manual wind architecture, is beautifully thin and you can see that gorgeous, gloriously domed crystal over the dial for a vintage off-axis distortion effect. This is my favorite of the Omega Museum watch series. And that's really saying something, because the series itself was extraordinary and a masterclass to the industry in how to create vintage homage watches. A limited series, just under 39 millimeters, of 1,945 pieces. All right. So, questions coming through tonight. From Joshua Polanski, does tungsten tarnish? My experience has been no, and I, I speak from several brushes with the material. In Hublot, in Oris, from Omega, in each case I've seen watches years old with absolutely not just no tarnishing of tungsten, but very little scratching and scuffing. It is as hard as its reputation. And I have to say, unlike, for instance, silver, which doesn't corrode but does tarnish, tungsten seems in practice, at least in horological applications, to be non-reactive. Okay, now we're not quite done with Omega, but I want to jump to a brand that I deeply love, that I feel is undersold by connoisseurs of horology. If you're a watch nerd and you've ever dismissed Cartier as a fashion watch, think again. Once the watchmaker to kings and the jeweler to kings, as well as the king of jewelers, I can say that in the modern era, under Carol Forestier Casapi, Cartier's manufacturer in Le Chaux de Fonds, which is entirely vertically integrated, has done amazing things. And look no farther than this Cartier Rotonde de Cartier Tourbillon double retrograde. Now this is a tourbillon with a 72 hour manual wound power reserve, a limited series of only 25 watches released in 2008. The watch is 42 millimeters in solid 950 purity platinum. You can see the dance of the escapement in the one minute tourbillon at six o'clock as well as the gleam of the mirror finished anglage of the bridges, the recurring Cartier motif across the, the brass bridges, beautifully rhodium coated, and the black polish of the tourbillon cage itself with black polished screw heads featuring chamfered slots. This is an exquisite watch. But what I need to show you is the main event, which you may be shocked to learn is not the tourbillon itself. All right, guys. This is a double retrograde. And the double retrograde features both the hours and the minutes. So this is a watch that always keeps the hands 
clear of the tourbillon, never obstructed. You can see the Cartier logo, black polished, even on the dial side. An absolutely extraordinary opportunity for someone to own a watch that retailed for $193,000 $200 in the year 2008, just before the grand crash. As a result, very few were paying attention when these watches came to market. This is a timepiece that deserves not just your respect, but your reverence and your love. I can tell you for a fact it's one not just my head, but my heart. That's the caliber manufacturer, 9450, 42 joules, manual wind, three-day power reserve from Cartier. Okay, guys. I noticed Andrew Holt has given a shout out to 100 years of Cartier's iconic tank. And that's a fact. The tank is 100 years old this year. I don't have a tank on the table tonight, but I have a watch that might be the most requested revival candidate of the modern era. A watch that debuted in 2002 and was dead just about a decade later, arguably the Cartier men's watch of all time and the Cartier men's watch of the 2000s. It is the Roadster Automatic. Now the watch is 37 millimeters across, 44 from lug to lug, Automotive imagery runneth over in the celebrated automatic 100 meter men's timepiece. You notice the screws retaining the bezel of the watch feature the profile of French taillights like a 1950 Mercury lead sled. The dial, a spitten image of the VDO and Jaeger instruments as featured on the dashboards of Porsche 356A, B, and C models during the 50s, as well as Mercedes 190 and 300 SL Sportsters. The watch also features a bit of a postmodern flourish in its Dagmar style flared crown guard and date magnifier. Look up Dagmar bumper Cadillac. You'll see exactly what I mean on Google. Check it out, keep me streaming, but you'll also note how the bracelet itself featured cambered links to arc around the curve of your wrist and a fully removable system wherein every link features screws. But you can remove the entire bracelet assembly with nothing but your fingernail. It was the first implementation of a quick release system that today lives on in the IWC Aquatimer borrowed from its corporate cousin Cartier allowing you to remove the bracelet with just your fingernail and swap it out for a rubber strap or leather to dress up or down as you see fit. Now, if you are a motorsports fan or you simply love technical timepieces and you want a little bit more complication in your Cartier, you can still go Roadster and you can get it in a larger case size, still steel, still 100 meters water resistant. Yes, they made a Cartier Roadster in a chronograph it's bigger, it's bolder, but it's inextricably linked to that fundamental design language that channels early 20th century Cartier flair, mid-century automotive imagery, and early 21st century postmodernism. A perfect blend of everything that is Cartier. And for under $10,000, I can't think of a more stylish Cartier complication to own. JPG commenting, I always liked the Roadster. You and me both. I've seen some exquisite things done with the Roadster. There were some haute de gamme models made in white gold that had wooden inlays, things you can scarcely imagine, that lived up to your imagined idea of what Cartier could be at its apex of achievement. And the Roadster, in my opinion, will be back. This is not going to be the kind of watch that dies a quiet death. I have a feeling by popular demand, the Roadster will return, which means if you own a Gen 1, you've got a certifiable collector's piece. All right, Edward Layden saying, I'm a car guy too. I love the Mercedes AMG SLS. We both do. I remember watching the countdown to the reveal on Mercedes website back in the 2000s. That was a special watch, the Neo Gullwing, and, and the AMG GT that followed, really important. I also want to remind you that it's not all about watches tonight, it's also about watch swag. And therefore, I am pulling names. Why not a good friend, a fellow AMG buff. Uh, this is AMG, no name given, but he did give me an address so I can send him a Rolex Victorinox Swiss Army Knife. Again, billet aluminum with all the fundamental functions. You've got a nail file so you can trim your nails a little bit better than I have. You've got a screwdriver, you've got a knife, you've got unmistakable Rolex engraving, and of course, everyone's favorite Swiss Army Knife complication. You can call it a complication, right? The scissors. Congrats, AMG. Do you own an AMG? Let me know, give me a shout out in the chat box if you've got AMG iron in your garage. Okay, guys. Uh, keep asking the questions, too. This is an interactive feature. 
All right, question. This is from uh, JBO Surf. I saw an article on Revolution Watches, by the way, the only watch magazine still worth reading, that said Mr. Porter is now selling some JLCs. That's right. Net a Porter, which is owned by the bigger Ukes Group, counts Richemont as one of its substantial investors. Therefore, from time to time, Richemont brands will be seen on Mr. Porter, formerly Net a Porter, now Ukes Group. All right. So we're not quite done with Omega. I want to give a shout out to what might be my favorite. Omega Chronograph ever rendered in a Seamaster case. Now, I love that museum watch, but if you know your Seamasters and you know your Seamaster 300s, my first luxury watch, then you know the Apnea, a 2003 special series with a vertically grained satin finished metallic silver dial designed in conjunction with the famous French record setting freediver Jacques Mayol. His name and his image, as well as his preoccupation and lifelong love of dolphins, blazon on the case back in place of the traditional seahorse. This is a watch that features the most unusual Omega chronograph of all time. For apnea free diving, that is air restriction without a rebreather, free diving, you have one minute increments, each one represented by a single aperture. Over the course of seven minutes, and you can see it happening in real time, each aperture changes color. Now, the world record for free, dri for free diving was under 14 minutes. Therefore, you have 14 minutes of duration representing the length of your dive, timing one must assume, out to the limit of human potential. It alternately turns silver and red, and that's how the chronograph functions. Because of the vertical clutch, you can also leave the chronograph running if you like to have center seconds to match your hours and minutes. Note the special profile of the hands. Jacques Mayol specifically asked Omega to create hands that would not obstruct the apertures during free diving. Therefore, this completely unique hand design feature on no other Omega watch is one of the many distinctive and unique seen nowhere else features on this watch. It also has the upscale applied index dial, glows like a torch, far more visible at night than the classic skeleton hand bond. It also features a traditional rotating unidirectional dive bezel. So if you want to time something longer than seven minutes, you simply line up the luminescent index with the minutes hand, and there you go. Of course, resetting this one is a little bit of theater because so much happens when you do. Still 300 meters water resistant, still a screw down crown, still hail and hardy, and it still features the famed milled out diving extension of the Seamaster 300 series. I love this watch, guys. Please buy it before I do. And that's no idle, that's no idle boast. I owned an Omega, and I still own an Omega Seamaster 300. First watch I ever received for high school graduation. It was with me through college. My first job in White Shoe Law, decided not to pursue that. And then later during my swim tests with the Navy, buy that one and start your own story with an Omega Seamaster. All right, Jacques Mayol, the V is giving him a shout out saying that they are romantic timepieces. All Omegas associated with the great man. Yes, the inspiration for the Luc Besson film, The Big Blue, Jacques Mayol, who unfortunately was taken from us too early, was a man of intense and romantic passions. The aquatic world was his, and you can have a small portion of his world with a watch like the Apnea. Okay, so Mike M. giving a shout out to the Apnea, saying he also likes the Omega NZL series. I do too, but the NZL is a series. There are two versions of this watch, black dial and silver dial, and that's it. All right. Note from Andrew Holt, Omega just opened a new factory in Bien near Geneva. All the watch journalists were added a couple of weeks ago, and that's true, which is why I covered it on This Week in Watches two weeks ago. You're not going to beat me to the punch, Andrew. All right, so let's finish up tonight with a special timepiece, a watch that I'm going to pull from my own past, and this is about as close near and dear to my heart as any watch gets from any of the brands on the table tonight. This is the Omega Seamaster Professional Diver 300 meter. Now this example right here is the reference 2532.20. It differs from the classic Pierce Brosnan Bond, the 2531, in that the dial is white, the bezel is polished, 
And unlike my old Bond, this one has applied indices for a more upscale aesthetic. Now it features all the hallmarks of the series. It features the helium escape valve for you saturation divers and desk divers who like to tell tales. You can see the famed Omega wave pattern on the gloss white dial. Legibility is excellent thanks to the blackened indices as well as the blackened skeleton style Bond hands. And this one is minimally worn and weathered and you can tell because the red shocks, for instance, on the end of the seconds hand haven't faded to the orange that they typically do when exposed to UV. Moreover, the watch features all of the original, let me polish it up so you can see it to better advantage, but all of the original blue lacquer in the polished bezel. These bezels age better than their anodized blue counterparts on the Bond because the lacquer is sunken and recessed, therefore it rarely takes an injury from scratches and scuffs. The polished metal also holds up much better than anodized aluminum. It's distinctive, it's handsome, it's versatile, and at 41.5 millimeters, almost anyone can wear it. It also features an Omega upgrade on the classic ETA 2892A2 ultra thin caliber. Underneath, it's in Omega form, the caliber 1120, which gains two extra joules for smoother pivoting, and thanks to that refinement, two extra hours of power reserve, 44 versus 42. Still a 300 meter diver, still hail hardy, and thanks to its slim profile, remarkably versatile. This is one you can wear with a business suit or a bathing suit, or if you are a Bond Persuasion fan, why not a tuxedo? Finally, remember, as with all these Seamaster 300s, the real party is in the clasp, fully milled out with a dive extension. I find this time of year, it's more relevant than ever, as you can wear it over a thick sweater or a winter coat, even if you're never going to take the plunge. All right, friends, thanks for joining us. We have one more order of business, though, before we part. I need to pick a fourth and final winner of our giveaway. So let me see, who have I got tonight in the chat box? Hmm. All right, Mark Morimoto, you are a winner. You're getting yourself a Rolex pen, congratulations. My gift to you, getting your holiday season started off right with Rolex, the first name in watches and the first present you're getting this year. Everyone, thank you for joining us on watch box reviews. We're gonna get back to our regular watch reviews tomorrow. I know I've been absent on this channel for a while. The pre-owned reviews are gonna to restart tomorrow morning, so stay tuned to this channel. Thanks again for joining us, and remember to check our new website at thewatchbox.com and download our Watchbox Collectors app while you're there. Until then, I'm Tim, this is Watchbox. They're the three amigos, actually now they're the five amigos. And thanks for logging on.